Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Ana Gonzalez Rueda. I'm an associate lecturer at the School of Art History, the University of St. Andrews. Welcome to this critical conversations panel on curating intersectional collections, which is organized as part of the Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree exhibition at the Wardlaw Museum, curated by students of the MLIT in Museum and Gallery Studies course at the University of St. Andrews. I am co-chairing the panel today with Joseph Bowman, who conceived this event inspired by Maud Salter's text, Call and Response. Um, this text was first published in Feminist Art News in 1988. And I'll start by quoting the opening lines, which seem particularly poignant today that we have learned that the Supreme Court in the US voted to overturn the Roe versus Wade abortion law. Uh, in 1988, then, Salter wrote, quote, As a black woman, I believe that if the women's movement is to survive, it must not only intellectualize about change, but be upfront to confront the status quo. As feminists, we must look at identity and its adoption more closely. Feminist identity has hardly been discussed at all. We must do so now as we enter a critical time for the women's movement, as for many other movements, end of quote. Today's conversation will hopefully explore how to be upfront to confront the status quo and look at identity and its adoption more closely in museum collections. We will probably come back to the text and speak more about Salter's concerns. For example, the, dan the dangers of the unspoken issue of sexuality and being written out of history or black women's efforts to transcend the labels of otherness her thoughts on coalition politics and questions about the future for black artists in this hostile world. Thank you everyone for joining us and I hand over to Joe who will introduce our speakers. Thank you Anna and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Joe and I'm currently a master's student on the MLIT Museum and Gallery Studies course. Uh, and I'm the learning and engagement lead for the Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree exhibition, uh, which is currently on display at the Wardlaw Museum until the 30th of May 2022. Um, I want to warmly welcome you all to the Critical Conversations panel, where again, the theme of the discussion is curating intersectional collections. The Critical Conversation is a part of the Wardlaw Museum, uh, the Wardlaw Museum's monthly event schedule, where different voices are brought together in order to discuss things that people might be missing from the museum. Today, we're going to be hearing from people who have studied topics relating to our theme, as well as people who have explored this subject deeply while studying at the University of St Andrews. So the panelists for today, uh, I'm going to share their names and then introduce them. Uh, then we will have a conversation for about 20 minutes. Uh, but it will start with Grace Strazen, who has worked a great deal on the intersectional themes of Maud Salter's work alongside myself and 10 other students. Um, and at the end, we will have some questions, a Q&A and a chance for um, to ask any one of us about our work or the panel's theme, um, which will take about five to 10 minutes. Um, we will also be sharing in the chat function a link to the student exhibition website on Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree where you can find some great resources about intersectionality in addition to more of an explanation about who Maud Salter is. Um, so look out for that link in the chat. Um, OK, so we will begin by reading out some of your names uh, where you can introduce yourself, um, which hopefully works for everyone. So first of all, we have Grace Strazen. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Hi. Um, yes, my name is Grace Strassen, um, and I am also an MLIT Museum and Gallery Studies student. Um, and uh, I was primarily interpretation writer with one other member of the team for the Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree intervention. Uh, and I also helped uh, make the website. Um, so uh, this summer as well, I will be writing a master's dissertation on the lack of work by female artists in the art market and how that influences museum spaces in a post-COVID world. Thank you. Ooh. Thank you so much, Grace. Um, thank you, Grace. Um, next up, we have Ashling Coase. Hi. 
Hi, um, my name is Ashlyn Coase. I am a final year undergraduate student um, in art history at the University of St. Andrews. So I've just finished up um, my final exams and I'm all done, which is really exciting. Um, I'm continuing on to postgraduate study in art history next year, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, and yeah, I was asked to come and speak a little bit about my experience studying art history here and how that might um, help us approach some of the themes in Maud's work. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ashling. Um, and next we have Lexi Davis. Hi, I'm Lexi Davis and I am a PhD candidate in the School of Art History at St. Andrews, uh, where I'm currently at work on a dissertation um, about how 1970s feminist artists were exploring the politics of domestic labor. So someone like uh, Maud Salter is really fascinating to me and to my own research. Um, and I'm really excited to speak more um, with the other panelists about her practice. Thank you so much, Lexi. Um, so this is the panel. And before we go into our conversation, um, Grace uh, is going to share with us exactly what intersectional intersectionality is. <laughs> uh, over to you, Grace. Perfect. Uh, yeah, just to kind of introduce the term briefly, uh, intersectionality uh, is a term that was coined by the civil rights uh, advocate Kimberly Crenshaw in 1989 uh, to describe a framework of thinking in which to understand how aspects of someone's social or political identity, um, such as gender, sex, race, uh, ethnicity, sexuality, class, religion, disability, or physical appearance uh, combines to create uh, different modes of discrimination and privilege. So how do these factors um, create overlapping advantages or disadvantages in society? So in a museum context, which is what we're talking about here, <laughs> um, intersectionality means understanding how identity-based exclusion in exists in all areas of museum practice. So that includes in collections, in programming, in physical spaces, and in the texts, amongst many other things. <laughs> uh, you speak a lot about um, like identity programming, and obviously a lot of Maud's work was all about kind of um, her kind of unearthing her identity in a lot of her work. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, we explored some of these themes in our exhibition at the Wardlaw, um, but as content specialist, writer and interpretations lead for the Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree exhibition, I was wondering if you could speak about how um, this is intersectional. Yeah, so I think firstly kind of um, introducing Maud Salter to everyone watching because I think she's not as well understood as she should be. <laughs> um, so Maud, the, the intervention explores uh, Maud Salter, who was a Scottish Ghanaian artist uh, who was born in 1960 uh, and was raised in Glasgow. Uh, so the intervention largely circulates around the series Significant Others, which Salter made in uh, 1993. Uh, so one of the core concepts of intersectionality in museums is addressing it through uh, you know, in university and institution collections. Uh, so this work, um, Significant Others, was acquired by the Harry and Marjorie Boswell collection in 2019 for the university collection. Uh, and the acquisition was part of a much larger effort uh, to address the lack of diversity in collections as well as um, exploring and uh, recognizing institutional legacies at the university. Um, so the photos in the Significant Other series are enlargements made by Salter from photos in her family archives. And um, they're very intimate works that uh, kind of glimpse at Salter's life, her um, identity, her heritage, um, and it presents lines of cross-cultural interaction between her Scottish and Ghanaian backgrounds. Um, reflecting her familial ties and her place as a black woman in a predominantly white environment of Scotland. Um, so she's recognized today for her creative practice, including art making and poetry and writing. She was, as previously kind of explored, she was um, involved in activism in the black feminist movement and the LGBTQIA plus movement. 
She also was part of the British Black Arts Movement. Um, so she really strived to put black women back in the center of the frame. That's kind of one of her famous quotes. Um, so this kind of the importance of her background was really relevant to our intervention because we wanted to ensure that we our project explored all of these different intersecting identities. So throughout the intervention, we tried to address things like um, her being from a working class background, her being black, her being Scottish, her being queer, her being mixed race, and her being a woman. So, because that's all as well things that she addressed a lot throughout her entire artistic practice. Um, and I think the, one of the main focuses as well was ensuring throughout the project that we uh, didn't limit her identity to just one, ensuring that we addressed all of them. Uh, we didn't pigeonhole her into one and really covering all the bases. <laughs> so I think this, this subject is very, very relevant both to her work as well as our intervention. Yeah, I think it's uh, really key that you mentioned this sort of shift in inclusion, especially for the university's collections, but also in the art sector. So like in art galleries and museums. Um, and I was wondering if Ashling, maybe you could talk a bit more about the shift towards this inclusion in the art sector, specifically on the Black British arts movement that uh, Maud Sorter is associated with. Yes, absolutely. Um, so I was I was having to think about this idea um, and immediately kind of given the contemporary moment, I thought of Sonia Bo Boyce, who is representing Britain um, at Venice right now. Um, and of course, Alberta Whittle representing Scotland. Um, Lubaina Hamid has her Tate retrospective and won the Turner Prize a few years ago. And it seems as a young person um, like this is a real moment uh, for black British female artists. And then I was kind of reading more and I realized that, um, you know, these artists have been doing this work since the 80s um, and it feels like it's it's new and, you know, kind of something new right now. But this was happening in, in the 80s. Um, the first um, female, uh, or no, the first black British artist to have a solo retrospective at the Whitechapel, and that was in 1988. Like, it's so long before I was born, it's not even funny. Um, so I think that was, you know, um, really interesting to me. Uh, and I think a lot of artists have felt that, and young black British artists have felt that. I was reading the letter um, that Evan Ifikoya wrote uh, that's included, um, or she spoke about uh, Maud Salter's edited volume, Passion, um, and how she wished she'd found that book while she was an undergraduate, how she didn't have it through the, the canonical art history education she received, but rather through her own uh, personal investigations into Black British art. And I think that that's a really important thing to think about, that there's a lack of history, a lack of the archive. Um, I was reading something by Eddie Chambers, um, and he was speaking about his own research into uh, the Black Art Gallery, which was active from 83 to 93, and how he approached Islington Council, um, asking for information about it um, because they were funding it at the time. And they said, oh, we have no record. Um, they destroyed all of the records. And, and so if you don't have this record, if every time it's, it's year zero, to use his phrase, um, how can you build a history of Black British art? Uh, and so I think that that's really important to think about, even though um, right now we're seeing all of these developments to recognize that it's not um, it's not just now it's about adding to the narrative and building these new narratives that, that go back years. Um, I also wanted to mention uh, uh, Inam Gibawanyo who I actually managed to have um, a discussion not unlike this with through my undergraduate degree. Uh, Dr. Kate Coucher organized a really great artist's talk for my class on African modernism um, and it was so great to talk to Anam. She's involved with the Black British Female Artist Collective, which I kind of see as a modern day um, follow up on on Maud's own work in that regard. Um, and she is also an artist of Ghana Ghanaian heritage who uh, interrogates these same questions about you know, identity um, through really powerful textile and performance work. Um, and so I think it's great as a young student to be encountering these narratives now through the, through the classroom. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts, but I just wanted to, to mention a few things. 
Thank you so much for that. Uh, I think you touched on a very important point. Um, and uh, in my own work with intersectionality, uh, I am I'm very interested in a political theorist Anna Karastathis interpretation of the concept. And if you don't know her book, I highly recommend it. Um, but basically, um, her interpretation of the concept uh, draws a lot of attention uh, to the fact that she sees it well as a, it has some um, temporality implications. Uh, so she speaks, for example, I love this idea. She speaks about how um, it points towards a hollow present, um, you know, that it's not enough, you know, and that makes us think about all the work that still needs to be done. So I think those connections, you know, that you have started making about the past and the present and the future are so important. Um, so yeah, I just I just wanted to uh, to mention that interpretation of intersectionality. Uh, I think the term she uses is um, the idea of intersectionality as a provisional concept, you know, kind of as a point of departure. Um, and I think it's such an interesting idea that can maybe apply in exhibition making. Um, yeah, <laughs> just to add that. Yeah, I think I think inclusion is really the key motivator here. Uh, and a, a lot of the time, marginalised voices are often ignored from the narrative. Um, I think there's actually a call and response quote um, which states, being written out of history can happen to you. There is no safety in collusion with those who want to oppress our art and suppress our voices, um, which I think kind of speaks really easily as to kind of the things that Ashling and Anna you were speaking of there. I was wondering, Lexi, I was wondering if you could explain what the importance of artists such as Maud Salter are when championing intersectionality. Yeah, so I think Maud Salter is a really interesting artist because she she wore so many hats, you know, in addition to um, her her art practice, she was also a poet. She was a curator. She had a critical writing practice. So um, in addition to all, all the artwork that she made, she was really creating a dialogue around a lot of the issues that are um, obviously very present um, in her visual art. And I think um, because she, she, had, she facilitated this really robust um, conversation, I, th I think it's really, um, she makes it really easy for us to just pick up um, kind of where she left off, unfortunately too early um, because she died um, sadly, quite young. Um, but I think when you when you look back at some of, um, especially some of her writing, like um, the article you mentioned, call in response, um, it's it still feels as urgent as ever. So I think um, you know when when returning to an artist like Maud Salter, um, we can kind of continue uh, many of the conversations that she started. And I'm specifically thinking of, you know, one part that really struck me was when she um, she said, who makes black women's work visible if not other black women? And I think this is still so true, you know, that um, it's mostly black people who are supporting the work of other black people, queer people supporting the work of queer artists, women supporting the work of women artists. And um, I think this is, for, for me, one of the biggest issues, you know, how do we, how do we, um, yeah, how, how do we approach intersectionality from this perspective um, where we're not trying to, um, you know, put everyone into a box or, or create, um, you know, like um, identity groups, um, but rather how do we, um, how do we um, build coalitions, which she also talks about in her article. Yeah, and I think actually learning about these artists can be like one of the most vital parts of championing the intersectional, uh, championing intersectionality for like future generations, and especially in current uh, collections and exhibitions. Um, Ashling, I was wondering if perhaps you could talk about your experience studying history of art and what this has taught you about like some of the themes present in uh, Maud Salter's work 
um, including like race, feminism, heritage. Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I'm just coming to the end of four years at St. Andrews. Um, and I think that if I look at the classes I've been able to take, especially in my last two years, I feel so lucky for the art history education that I've had and the scope. Um, I've focused on modern and contemporary, but across a, a really vast geographic range, I've taken modules in Latin American art, in African art, uh, and in European and British. And I think that, that having that um, has been so invaluable for me as now I start to specialize and, and each module has taken has brought kind of new narratives that now I have in my head and I'm thinking about all, you know, they, everything interlaps, it, it comes back to similar themes and it's it's a global issue. And I think having these different perspectives is so important. Um, I think, especially studying uh, Latin American modernism, I was, we were looking a lot at um, kind of, in terms of feminism, how a lot of the kind of key feminist uh, texts in art history have been you know, from a white feminist perspective and, and understanding the indigenous um, feminism that is maybe, you know, slightly different, uh, that, that kind of can compound that and can help it. I think in my African class, I uh, encountered the artist Santi Mofukang, who is a South African artist, but I he really made me think of Maud Salter's work because he had this great project called the uh, Black Family photo album um, where he basically took photographs of families and and blew them up in, in a similar way. Um, but it's about, again, rewriting uh, people who've been left out of, of these narratives into art history and into the canon. Um, and I think photography is a really powerful medium to do that. Um, it has this really privileged relationship to the real, which has been maybe appropriated by um, by colonial powers and things like that, um, and the, then it's being subverted by artists like Maud um, and like Santi Um and yeah. So I think that that, that idea of expanding the narrative, uh, expanding the archive, and, and bringing these new narratives to to art history is is really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the time expanding this narrative uh, can be quite like a intimidating thing, but actually it's in these art institutions like galleries and museums whereby this is actually whilst it has a lot of problems as well it can be like a powerful tool uh so i think lexi um can what can museums do to promote these marginalized voices and groups of this sector in an inclusive way yeah i think it's a really hard question and museums are most museums are trying very hard to come up with their own answers. Um, I think uh, Solter gives a really good um, potential answer to this question when she talks about coalition building. Um, so really the importance of bringing different groups together in dialogue. And I think really what's really important is to make sure that it's an ongoing dialogue. So a lot of, um, you know, a lot of diversity and inclusion programs are um, short term, you know, a, a lot of people even think of, you know, of diversity and inclusion as a box to check or, you know, a mandatory training event. I mean, I think we're all familiar with the kind of conversations that have been going on in the museum world and really how much worse it is than um, we even might have thought. Um, in, in terms of diversity and um, access and inclusion being addressed um, in a sustainable way. Um, so I so yeah, I think really ensuring that that these kind of discussions and projects um, are, are ongoing and um, continued is very important. But I also think um, another um, potential way to promote um, marginalized groups um, is for uh, you know, bigger, wealthier museums with with more resources and more power to share their platform. Um, you know, they have the ability to um, reach out to, for example, smaller organizations, which oftentimes have a very different audience, um, have very different perspectives. And I think, um, you know, by by partnering with these um, 
you know, you know, sharing resource resources um, and partnering with smaller organizations. This is one way to really, um, you know, create a more um, sustainable ecosystem um, that's that's more inclusive and accessible. Um, can I can I jump in? Um, OK, well, uh, thank you so much for that, Alexi. I just wanted to comment on um, on a few things. I mean, I do think that the politics of coalition is is such is such an interesting idea, but I also think we need to recognize um, that we shouldn't idealize the concept either, you know, and how it has, you know, to acknowledge like the differences that can come in those coalitions or alliances as well. So that, you know, I don't know, I think that many times in museum studies and, you know, in museums practice, we use these nice words like inclu also inclusion, you know, that can then prove like a very limiting framework and kind of go um, unquestioned, you know, and sometimes they can be used uh, just to tick boxes, you know. So I think we should also be very, um, very careful and, and really, uh, you know, really put pressure on our institutions, uh, you know, from thinking about who, how the how the staff in each of institution, you know, who are the curators, who are the directors, who are the cleaners, who are the invigilators, you know, and and speak and be able to speak about these issues openly. Um, for example, I have seen recently, and I'm very happy to see this, that some museums are being challenged with, you know, um, their adverts for uh, unpaid, you know, voluntary positions. You know, which only replicates uh, these um, these really unfair uh, structures. So, um, you know, as as the as the audience, but not 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 only as the public, but you know, as museum specialists and as art historians, we should be, I think, demanding much more of our of our institutions, right? And um, and make sure that they kind of match those words with with actions. Yeah, I think we should actually open this question to more people. Uh, Grace, how do you think, how are museums addressing intersectionality? Um, well, that's a very, very big question. Um, I think a lot of institutes and um, a lot of people in the career in the field nowadays are kind of starting out by really properly examining their audiences as well as the like communities that surround them and the communities that they're trying to reach and seeing if those two things match up. Um, is our communities fully being reflected in their audiences? Um, like because museums should be reflective of the museums that they serve. Um, or of the communities that they serve. <laughs> um, so I think really just starting with institutions reflecting very critically on who is being addressed and represented in their spaces. Um, so for us, you know, in this discussion, I think um, one of the main focuses in, is in terms of collections. Uh, so just looking at their collections, is, is it reflective um, of their audiences? Um, clarifying collection policies to be more inclusive, if we use the term inclusive or representative or diverse. Um, uh, and that like today is becoming a much larger thing as well. Like uh, I actually read <laughs> a paper yesterday for my dissertation um, on uh, the fine, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, recently sold one of their works uh, by Rothko for $40 million and in response bought 11 works by women because that was their main collection policy at the moment is to just bring more women into the collection and include that and, and it shouldn't just be women, it should be everything, it should be intersectional, but it's kind of starting with really addressing some of the core problems. Um, I also think you can definitely, a lot of institutes are moving beyond collections. Um, for example, uh, 
the my local museum at home uh, has a free day every Sunday, which I think in the UK is a little bit less relevant because I know a lot of the museums here are free to get into anyways. But in the US, they have free days to try to encourage um, people from lower incomes to come in. And that like concept in itself of um, understanding uh, like wealth disparity in museums, I think um, is something that I studied during my undergraduate degree. We looked at the exhibition um, uh, if you lived here at the D-Arts Foundation, uh, curated by Martha Rosler, and it was all about understanding the homeless community in New York. And they invited, Martha Rosler invited the homeless community in, they curated an entire show about it, they created um, a town hall where they invited government officials to try to create some sort of conversation between the two. So I think there's like so many different aspects that museums can take or so many different approaches that museums can take um, so when it comes to collections. That's the big one. That's kind of the one with the money involved. But there's also smaller things there's smaller policies and smaller um, changes that can um, be done. And I think as well when it comes to collections it's also something that I was learning a lot about in the exhibition was how do you present those works as well. Um, there was an amazing uh, intervention done by Fred Wilson at the Maryland Historical Society in I think it was 1992 to 93 um, where he rewrote the majority of the labels in the space to address voices that were not being heard. So specifically there's a number of painting landscape paintings um, that were only identified by place and did not acknowledge the fact that there were black men in the background doing work. And so he rewrote them and gave them identities. And basically the idea was renaming and recentering, bringing like a, this again, the kind of a theme of bringing uh, an a, a awareness to the reality of historical representation. So I think museums can approach it from so many different angles. And it's something that is really important for us to all be learning about uh, because when we hopefully, well, I think most of us go out into that field, it's something that we should be able to bring towards these institutes. Yeah, I, I think it seems like the key towards kind of uh, curating intersectional collections seems to be like this championing of these marginalized groups and ensuring that they're at the center of the discussion from the beginning to end and that these uh, discussions are being uh, re represented proactively and this discussion continues not beyond the exhibition, not just during the time that they might be being represented in this space. Um, Lexi, how do we make sure that these exhibitions that do focus on these artists um, from historically marginalized groups are not considered niche. Yes, this is a really difficult question and one that I've been thinking about a lot lately, um, especially since um, about a month ago, I went to a um, symposium at a major museum here in Amsterdam called uh, Women in the Arts. And it was, you know, a day of uh, talks about um, women, uh, women artists, but also about, you know, um, inclusivity, like how women can be better re represented within the museum. And I, I think out of 100 people who were there, there were only something like three men in the audience and everyone was remarking on this and it was really disappointing. Um, and I, I was really surprised, honestly, that in 2022, um, you know, so many men still thought this isn't relevant to me. And it's d definitely, you know, something I see often um, with, you know, historically marginalized groups being represented in, you know, whether it's a symposium or an exhibition, that if you look in the audience and you see, um, you know, a lot of the people who could really benefit from being here, from experiencing this, think that it's not um, relevant to them. And so how to how to uh, confront this problem is, of course, very complex. Um, but um, and, and I'm not sure that I have immediately an answer to that, but I think it, it maybe also um, is related to the kind of labor hierarchies that exist within museums. So at least um, most of the museums I've worked for, um, education departments have um, been almost entirely women and um, you know also a, a, a large number of women of color, um, especially in comparison to um, other departments um, and especially in comparison to executive staff. 
Uh, and I think this really um, touches on a lot of the issues at the heart of this, you know, th this idea that um, uh, outreach and diversity are, you know, are the problem of, um, of you know, the people that it affects. So of, of women, of people of color, etc. So the, the mentality that, oh, this is your problem, you, you deal with it, when actually it should be every department, um, you know, dealing with um, diversity, inclusion, access, um, you know, every department should be thinking about this. And, and as Anna said, you know, not just in a, a sort of lip service kind of way, but in a, in a sustained long term engagement. Um, and I think, you know, having this discussion with all, with all different kinds of um, museum workers, artists, um, uh, audiences, and, and not just um, making this the work of one department of education, I think is um, is really key. And, and maybe it's also related to curatorial programming as well. Um, the idea that, um, you know, it's this kind of a laziness, I think, this idea that the blockbuster show is always going to be someone like Matisse or Chagall. And, um, you know, you, you have the blockbuster show and then you have, um, you know, usually a group exhibition or something um, uh, focused on, you know, X group of artists. And sometimes these shows are really great, you know, sometimes they're really critical and they focus on, um, you know, a, a movement or a, a historical moment from a way that really um, builds a dialogue around that. But sometimes they're really lazy and sometimes it's just like women who paint landscapes or something like this. And it feels like such an afterthought. So I think, you know, it's also kind of how can we, you know, instead of, you know, just assuming that the Chagall retrospective is the blockbuster, maybe we should ask, you know, how do we make this other show, um, you know, about queer performance art or something? How do we make that into the blockbuster rather than just thinking, you know, it's not possible? Um, yeah, that's a see. I totally. I this is what I've been looking at, <laughs> um, kind of while looking at the art market, and uh, I think it's totally a valid point of what counts as blockbuster. And I think in a large part there's a big financial aspect to that, of the fact that women are still massively underrepresented in the art market, and collectors are less inclined to buy them. And there's lots and lots of assumptions about why, um, like. And a lot of them are exactly the same assumptions as you can read about from Linda Nochlin from the 1970s. Um, and I think it's really, I agree, you have to kind of go in at the start. Like in the United States, um, master of fine arts uh, degrees are made up by 50% women, but then only about 13% of people who make up uh, collectors are, or are picked up by art galleries and such are women. So I do think there's it's like a communication of at the very start understanding the value and I think that's something that like Linda Auckland brought up with the idea of genius and why like is it that women artists are less genius and no <laughs> obviously not so I think it's I, I agree I think it's an educational thing as well and I think there are a lot of benefits today to um, bringing people like more people into this um, rhetoric and into the conversation and into collections um, I think like uh, one of the things I've been looking at is the fact that women's art is actually cheaper. So in a COVID world, uh, if you're trying to bring more work into collections, it's beneficial to <laughs> buy art by women. Um, I think it's like a very interesting examination of um, at what point in the conversation, wh where can we change the conversation? Um, and I think blockbuster shows as well. I was reading about um, uh, the Guggenheim had an exhibition on Hilma Af Klimt during COVID and it has broken every single record, uh, the most merchandise, the most ticket sales. So I do think that, you know, there's evidence to show that a blockbuster show is not just going to be white men and you can make just as much success from other people. I think it's really um, at an institutional level challenging that and, you know, bringing that to the forefront. Yeah, I think you bring up another really fascinating 
um, point uh, that also I think about a lot, which is the fact that so much of the art uh, in museum collections are donations from collectors. And then, you know, what are what are these collections? As you said, they are mostly, um, you know, a very particular kind of art by very particular kind of artists. And th that's a really a challenge, I think, um, you know, when when a museum collection depends so heavily on the generosity of, of donors, of collectors, how can you shape your collection when you're when you when you're depending on um, you know on donations that you have not necessarily um, selected yourself that have been given to you? And I, I don't have an answer to that question. It's I just think it's a yeah it's a, it's an interesting problem. Thank, thank you so much, both Grace and Lexi. You made me think uh, about many things, but uh, one of the main problems, I think, because it's a very complex and difficult topic. Um, and when I'm thinking now about, you know, feminist curating or, you know, feminist exhibitions, uh, I think that also, oh, I, I, my, it's working, right? I'm okay because I got, uh, the sign to admit. Okay, uh, yeah. So that I think that intersectionality kind of also uh, pushes us to think not only about feminist curating or feminist exhibitions, but about you know the tensions between feminisms and the real divisions between sometimes between feminisms. So I think it's um, I, again I don't have any solutions or answers to offer here, but I think. The intersectional approach is um, is very challenging and uh, and a very urgent one as well. I think this actually brings us really nicely to our, the Q and A portion of our panel discussion today. Um, I'm not sure if we have any questions at the moment. Um, instead, perhaps Ashling, I was wondering if we could do a final question with you, perhaps. Um, where like where do you see the future of uh intersectional collection collecting and curation yeah um i think uh thinking about this question i i was thinking about something that i read um by lubaina hamid and she was writing about how any uh, meaningful representation of black British would be dependent on five elements, um, which was funding, education, galleries, art history and audience. And I think this is a really great way to think about um, more broadly discussions about intersectionality and greater diversity um, in museums. I was reading a book recently, um, which is really great. It's um, called The Future of the Museum. Um, and it's basically inter uh, interviews with loads of different museum directors. Um, and uh, Andriana Pedrosa, who's the director of the Museo de Arte de Sao Paulo in Brazil, said, I don't think we'll ever get to fully decolonize or de-westernize the museum because the museum itself is a, Europe is a European construct. And I think thinking about that, like the structures of the museum from, you know, the, the kind of more idealistic uh, curatorial narratives right down to every like, practical aspect of the museum, has been uh, developed in a very particular context, and it's the Western context. I think I would acknowledge that and, and question how we can uh, shape that and deconstruct it. Um, and I think, especially seeing newer museums, uh, art, uh, contemporary art galleries, and things opening um, beyond the West, you know, in Africa and Asia, particularly uh, the new M Plus Museum in Hong Kong, and and all of these institutions, I think. That they're not burdened by historical um, uh, his, uh, historical collecting uh, traditions and by the collections that they have, um, they can really create something that, that's, I don't know, more relevant maybe to the contemporary moment. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, another, you know, uh, another point uh, about education is really uh, important to think about here in terms of the future of collecting because it starts from the ground up. I think I was drawn to art history and to study this for my undergrad because I saw within art an articulation of my own uh, kind of lived experience and if other young people who don't you know who have 
different backgrounds to me are not seeing that, then why would they want to study art history if it, they don't feel that it's relevant to them? And then why would they want to become curators, museum directors? I think it's about addressing it at every stage um, and making sure that, you know, at every point, right from the very beginning of art historical education, we're thinking about these issues. Can I thank you? Thank you so much, Asling, um, for for those comments. Um, I just wanted to say that I heard someone recently say that you know that now we cannot go back to kind of the before of the decolonial turn in museums. And and I don't know, just listening to you makes me very hopeful that. You know, of course, the decolonial turn um, involves uh, issues of gender, but I hope that we can, you know, really kind of keep working towards bringing maybe an intersectional turn to, <laughs> to museum practice. Thank you so much, Anna uh, and Ashling, for that. Um, I think we're down to our final minute, um, so I'm just going to do a little ending a bit here. I just want to encourage everyone to go to the Maud Salter Portraits of a Family Tree exhibition at the Wardlaw Museum. Uh, we have a microsite online also that features a lot of valuable links uh, and resources. And if there's anything that you've heard about today or any of the discussions that you want to learn about a bit more, um, you can find a lot of information there. But I'm sure um, all of the panelists if you, maybe if someone wants to email one of them, <laughs> they'd be really happy to um, answer any more questions uh, if you are so inclined. Um, so I'd like to thank all of our wonderful, wonderful panelists, uh, my co-chair Anna <laughs> and Elisa backstage as well. Um, so thank you all for coming. <laughs>